This video is going to be all about the Pentax K1000, a camera that I've owned since 1979. And I want to have a good look and find out if this is truly the cult camera that everybody's talking about. Let me take you back to 1979, when I was 13 years old and living in a small town called Hudsonville in the state of Michigan in the US of A. Photography was my number one interest. The only thing was, I did not have a camera and I didn't have the money to buy a camera. So a good school friend of mine, Chris Demarest, introduced me to an employer and I was taken on board to pick tomatoes in greenhouses during the summer. And initially I chose to buy a Fuji SLR. So after about six or seven weeks, I had put down enough money to take the camera home. And then something strange happened. I was loading a roll of film in the Fuji SLR and I wanted to advance the film and the advance lever broke. I took the camera back to Myers and they said, would you like to have your money back? or would you like to exchange the camera for another camera? And that's when I chose for the Pentax K1000. So it was not my first choice, but I'm glad that the advance lever of the Fuji SLR broke because this is a very interesting camera to have as a first camera. Okay, then you're 13 years old. Let me explain how it feels when you buy your first camera. It's like getting a new bike for your birthday. It's something that you will never forget. And I'm glad that after even more than 40 years, I still have the exact camera that I bought in 1979. Let's now have a look at some of the first photos that I took with this camera. though I have a personal and emotional connection with my Pentax K1000, I will try to be as objective as I possibly can and give you an unbiased view on a very interesting camera. Let's have a closer look at the Pentax K1000, which weighs in at 776 grams. So let's first have a look at the form factor of the Pentax K1000. And to be honest with you, there is no form factor. It's a very classic design. It's very square. And that means with regards to using this camera, you could almost compare it to holding a brick when you're making your photos. So let's first look at the top plate where we have the film advance lever with an integrated film counter, as you see here. We have a very small orange dot here in between. When I press the shutter, it disappears. And when you advance the film, it returns again. So it's an indication that you have advanced the film for an next photo. We have the shutter release button to which you can connect the shutter release cable. And then we have the shutter 
speed dial, which goes from B through to one second all the way up to one one thousandth of a second. Very good click dial. We have one sixtieth of a second for flash sync. And when we pull up the outer ring on this shutter dial, we can change the ISO level of the film, which is indicated in this very little window here, which corresponds with the internal light meter. Then we have our X mount for flash and we have our standard film rewind knob. When we look at the bottom plate, of course, we see the button which we compress to rewind the film. We see a tripod mount and we see a battery compartment for a one and a half volt LR44 battery. And last but not least, the serial number. So it's a very plain bottom plate. When we look at the back of the camera, we have, of course, the viewfinder. And we have here written down Asahi Optical Company, which indicates that this specific model was one of the early versions. Later on, they were made outside of Japan. So if you're looking for a Pentax K1000 and you make sure this is on the back of the camera, then you have the early version, which has a better build quality. And of course, we can open the back by pulling up the film rewind knob. So let's have a look at the front of the camera where we see the Penta prism on which it says Asahi Pentax. We see that it is a K1000 and we have two rings to connect a neck strap, which in my opinion is a little bit awkward because if you connect a neck strap to these two rings, which, which are more positioned to the front of the camera, your camera often hangs slightly slanted in front of you. Then we have on the side here an external flash connection and a button which we can compress to release the lens. So when we compress that button and turn the lens counterclockwise, we can take the lens off the camera body. And if we align this white dot with the button which we just compressed, you can easily put it back onto the camera body. Pentax K1000 cameras are renowned for the fact that this button here often breaks. So this is a fragile part of the camera. And as you can see, mine is still okay. We also see that we have a standard 50mm 2.0 Pentax M lens. This is a lens that came with the camera when I bought it back in 1979. With regards to the lens, I would like to mention that the lens has an aperture range of 2.0 to f22. The aperture from f16 to f22 is one whole stop. The aperture from f2 to f2.8 is also a whole stop. All the apertures in between are half stops. That's good to know, again, because you need to know where you are and where you're going to. So that's important to note that there's a difference between half stop and a whole stop. But first of all, let me say that all the photos have been taken on a roll of Ilford Delta 400. And this is a 24 exposure roll of film. It was developed in Ilford ID11 for 14 minutes at 20 degrees Celsius in a 1 to 1 ratio.
Now that we've had a closer look at the Pentax K1000, let me try to answer the question why this camera is being seen as a cult camera. Being used back in the day, but even today, by students learning photography. Well, like I mentioned, it is a fully manual camera. You determine shutter speed and aperture. And when you look through the viewfinder, it does not give any information with regards to the shutter speed or the aperture that the camera is set on at that moment. The only thing you see when you look through the viewfinder is a needle which you need to center exactly in the middle to get a correct exposure. Now by forcing you to be aware of shutter speed and aperture, it's also going to slow down the photography process and make you think about appropriate shutter speed and aperture combination not only for using the lag meter, but also for getting the results that you're trying to achieve. That's the primary reason why this is such an interesting camera to learn photography. It slows down the photography process. It is therefore a slow camera to use, especially in the beginning, when you're not sure which shutter speed and aperture you're on. But it can be used a little bit faster. For example, if you put in a 100 ISO film and you're shooting outside in bright conditions and you set the shutter speed to 1 25th of a second, the only thing you need to do is hold up the camera, change the aperture until the needle is centered and take the photo. So in that sense, you're using it as a shutter priority camera. And then it is reasonably fast, but even so, clicking away with your aperture, you're never knowing exactly where you are. And that can determine what kind of results you're going to achieve. For example, if I'm using a 2.8 aperture, I'm getting a very shallow depth of field. If I'm using f8 or f11, I will get a good depth of field and probably the best results with this lens. That is the best aperture for this lens. So you always need to be aware of where you are. If you use it in aperture priority mode and you only change the shutter speed, you have to be aware of the fact that you might get into slower shutter speeds of, for example, 1 30th or 1 15th of a second. One camera shake can come into play and your photos are going to be out of focus. So you need to know where you were and you need to know where you're going. Are you going clockwise or are you going counterclockwise? With shutter speeds, it is one stop difference. And with the aperture ring, it's a half a stop difference in some cases, and sometimes it's a full stop. So you need to know where you are and where you're going to. That's important. And that's the reason why this is being seen as a cold camera, besides the fact that it has a very good build quality and it has an excellent array of Pentax lenses with a K bayonet fitting. That's the primary reason. Once you start using this camera, then you really start to learn the photography technique. Well, that's been a long video taking you all the way back to 1979. And there's not a whole lot I can tell you about this camera. Let's be honest about that. It is very simple to use. But the fact that it is fully manual and very simple to use and of high build quality makes it the perfect camera to learn photography. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you have, give it a thumbs up. If you haven't subscribed yet, you're more than welcome to do so because I'm going to be bringing out a lot more videos with regards to cameras, both analog and digital, and also photography technique. Thanks again, greatly appreciate it. Take care and I'll see you next time.